this is our first podcast of our solutions unit. So we're going to be talking about solutions. Hey, doesn't that work? Solutions are a homogeneous mixture. We'll go back through some of these vocab words. And most common solutions up there, that picture, the ocean. So it's a mixture of a lot of different salts and compounds mixed in with the water. Okay, speaking of water. Water is pretty important in solutions. It's usually the solvent we use. So let's kind of do a review on water. Remember when we drew the formula for water, hopefully that's a given, H2O, we had oxygen in the middle with its eight valence electrons and it ended up being a bent molecule and it was a very, very, very polar molecule. And remember, polar means an uneven distribution. This end is very negative. Oops, excuse me. This end was positive because it was a lack of electrons. You had more electrons on this part of the water molecule. So what that did is it gives water a lot of its special properties. One of those properties is the density of solid water. Most substances, as they become a solid, become more dense. And let's a reminder, of, let's kind of think this out. Density is the mass divided by volume. Well, when we do a phase change, the mass doesn't change. So typically, the volume gets smaller because those molecules get compacted together. And so as you take up a smaller volume, as you divide by a smaller number, the density goes up. But that doesn't happen with water. Okay, because solid water is less dense than liquid water. Okay, how do we know this? Yep, you're right. How do we know? Ice floats. That's our proof. And in fact, we know that the maximum density of water actually occurs at 4 degrees Celsius. That happens, because look at this, when water freezes, this hydrogen bond right there, that's the hydrogen bond, Remember, that's the strongest intermolecular force. It's an intermolecular force. It's like a magnet holding these molecules together. That strong attraction, it actually locks the water molecule at about four degrees into this hexagon shape. This is why we get snowflakes and water crystals. So what happens is it's actually um, locking it into a volume that is greater than the volume of a liquid. So now we have the same mass divided by a larger volume, so therefore the density goes down, and that is why we have float we have, excuse me, ice that floats at the top of a lake when it freezes, which I saw in Alaska, not so much here in Texas. But we know you get a layer of ice at the top when you're going through that. Okay, so it's that hydrogen bonding again. Remember, a review on that. It's the force between the molecules. And that water is a very, very, very polar molecule. And what it does, it gives us, we already talked about the density, but some of the other properties. Universal solvent. It dissolves many, many things. I think this is actually on the next slide. It can dissolve many, many substances. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. It has a high surface tension. So what that means is it pulls those molecules together and it makes like water drops and you can, um, you see bugs sometimes walking on the water. It has a high boiling point. Its boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. We know that. That's really high compared to other similar, similar. Excuse me, I can't talk. Shaped molecules and the ones of the uh, the same molar mass. So that universal dis solvents means water dissolves many things. Okay, we have the saying, like dissolves like. What that's talking about is polarity. So water will dissolve other polar compounds. Because what happens when you dissolve, there's an attraction between the water. So let's say this is water. There has to be an attraction between the water and the ions. So it also dissolves ionic compound. Because remember, this is like a charge. Opposites attract. And if there's another polar molecule, let's see, what? Um, sugar. So if I have sugar, sugar is this long chain molecule and there's a double bond here that makes it polar this is going to be attracted actually to the positive there's an attraction here 
and so what happens is it's going to dissolve. So actually when you're doing the dissolving, let's look at a little animation, see if I can stop his talking. Oh. Sodium chloride okay, dissolved. so we're adding some sodium chloride to this mixture. And look at salt disappears, physical change. But let's look at what's happening in this. Okay, so here's my ionic compound, obviously drawn much bigger. It's sodium, it's the positive, and it's smaller, chloride. Look at how the water molecules are attracted to the ions, but look at how they surround it. Opposites attract. So the negative end of the water will go around the positive end of the ion. And see, the negative part of the water is attracted to the positive part and it surrounds those molecules and it's separating the ions and this is what we were seeing today when we said is it a electrolyte or not so water separates the ions that's why it's just a physical change you're just separating it you're not changing it into anything new so this rule of thumb I kind of talked about like dissolves like it's based on polarity so it's based on polarity. The polarity of the two substances, of the solvent and of the solute. You compare the two. So if it's a polar substance, it will dissolve in polar water. So polar dissolves in polar. Nonpolar substances will dissolve in nonpolar solvents. And we'll kind of show this on, we'll do some demos and compare two different things and look at how we can be able to identify it. But what this means, you're going to have to go back and remember, how do I know if something is polar or nonpolar? And remember, nonpolar was very even distribution. Nonpolar was an uneven distribution. So water therefore can dissolve polar compounds, but it also dissolves a lot of ionic compounds because it's such a strong polar bond. And so that's again why we call it the universal solvent. Okay, some vocab that we need to make sure that you know. And I've added some more here because sometimes I assume you know some of those words. So if you do not know any of these words that are on there, you write them down. Okay, again, so a mixture. We're talking about a solution. A solution is a mixture. A mixture is just a blend of two or more substances. <coughs> Solutions are specifically a homogeneous mixture, which means they have uniform composition. They are the same composition throughout. It's an even uniform composition. Okay, soluble. I don't think that's in there. You need to make sure you know what soluble is because we're going to be using that word over and over and over. So soluble means it can dissolve. If something is soluble, it will dissolve. So therefore, if something is insoluble, that means, and it's, let's see if I can actually, wow, let's see if I can actually put insoluble, then it means it does not dissolve. Okay, so again, a solution is just a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. And when we have that, I've been using these words, the solvent is what's doing the dissolving or what you have the most of. The solute is what is being dissolved. So again, vocab words I expect you to know because we'll start having to calculate that and it's grams of solute over the total amount. So you need to know what's being dissolved. That's what you're going to have to get the grams. Oh wait, it's not grams, it's moles. Yes, it is moles. Okay, so what we are checking today, is it an electrolyte? So salts that we saw that the video, that little animation, you look at what you were making, you were making ions. So to have an electrolyte, you need to have ions. Therefore, it needs to be an ionic compound. So we say that it's a strong if it has a lot of ions. So it needs to be an ionic compound. And it needs to be soluble. So a soluble ionic compound will be a good conductor. If, okay, if something is slightly soluble, it will be a weak conductor. But again, it still needs to be ionic because you still have to have the ions. 
So we say it's a non-electrolyte, does not conduct electricity. Therefore, these are going to be your molecular compounds because they do not have the ions. Now, something happens with acids, but when we get to the acid units, we'll kind of talk about what acids do. So we did the conductivity, and we looked at the conductivity tester. You just tested some substances. See, and again, acids, we'll come back to those. But let's say um, sodium chloride. Is that going to connect? Wow, yes, look, at it lights it up. Now, conductivity doesn't mean it's generating electricity. This is kind of what's happening in the conductivity tester. These are two, it's, a, it's power to a battery. And so if there's ions to complete the circuit, then it's going to work. Okay, sodium sulfate. There's our solution, and it's going to conduct. Look at these are all, if we go back to these, what do these all have in common? They're all ionic compounds. These all will conduct. And actually, we're going to see something else is this. We're going to, then we'll be talking about solubility rules, and we see these all have sodiums and ammoniums. Those are all soluble. Pretty soon, you're going to be able to know that, looking at that. So an alloy is a special type of a solution that we won't be really spending much time in this unit talking about because most of our this unit is going to be looking more at our aqueous solutions and not the solid solutions. But don't forget overall that a metal solution, a mixture of two metals is, an alloy is a solution. And we looked and we tried to make the pennies. Our didn't work out that awesome, but we were trying to make those brass pennies that we were mixing the copper with the zinc. But lots and lots of alloys. And they usually you alloy something to make it stronger. Okay, so some other kinds of mixtures. Solutions have the smallest particles. Those particles, the solute particles, get so small you can't see them. Well, what if the solute particles aren't that small? So what we have is a colloid. And a colloid is a medium-sized particle. That means that they're a little bit bigger than the solution. So what happens is they don't really get so small and get evenly distributed. They actually kind of hang out. They hover. They're not so big that they're going to settle to the bottom, but they are not so small. You can still kind of see them. Some examples of colloids. Let's see. Oh, I have a little video. Let's look at this. This guy's kind of lame. Mixtures, like paint, are called colloids. A colloid is a mixture in which the particles are mixed together but not dissolved. The particles in colloids do not settle out and are continually bombarding each other. Shaving cream is a foam that is a colloid. Fog and smoke are colloids and appear quite cloudy. The liquid on the left is a gelatin, a colloid. The liquid on the right is colored water, a non-colloid. Due to the properties of the gelatin, light can pass through it and the particles seen, but the particles in the colored water on the right cannot be seen. Okay, so that last thing we were looking at with the video, <clears throat> I'm going to come back to this. That was called the Tyndall effect. Okay, that was that last thing when he was passing the flash flashlight through it. A colloid, that's how you can tell the difference. A colloid, will light will scatter. Okay, some of you, a lot of you I know are starting to learn to drive and when they tell you to put the lights, if it's foggy, you should put your lights on low beam. Put them down low because if you have them on high beam, they're going to scatter and the light can actually reflect back. That's the Tyndall effect. So common colloids here, if you look, a lot of the foods you eat, mayonnaise, butter, they're sus they have particles that are actually suspended in there. A lot of times they're a mixture of two different phases, a gas and a liquid. So if you look at most of these are two phases. That's why they're not a solution. Okay, now the, a suspension then, the suspension has really, really big particles that are so large that they actually settle out. And again, if we're talking food, think of orange juice. What do you do before you drink your orange juice? You shake it. Here's this wonderful guy again. A suspension is a heterogeneous mixture in which some of the particles settle out. The particles and the water in this paperweight form a suspension. The water 
in this raging river also forms a suspension. This flask of water was taken from the silty river. Let's see what happens if we let it stand for several hours. After a few hours, you can see the water is clear and the particles have settled to the bottom. If you look closely, you can see different sizes of particles. When rivers rise over their banks, as seen here, silt and particles often drop out of suspension. No, I don't think we need to watch it again. Okay, so what's the difference then between a solution, a colloid, and a suspension is the size of the solute particles. So the solutions are the smallest, so small you can't see them that we say it's homogeneous. Colloid, I've seen different definitions. Some say homogeneous, some say heterogeneous. Um, so a suspension, it's definitely heterogeneous, and those particles are so big they do not dissolve. You can see them, and they will settle out. So our whole unit will be talking about solutions and different things we can talk about is how much will they dissolve. If they dissolve, hey, what affects it? If I change the temperature, will it change the amount that's being dissolved? So we're looking at solutions, and then, yes, there's math. We're going to calculate the concentration of a solution, how much is actually dissolved in there. We will see you on our next class.